Good morning, NCC. If you will, go with me to Judges chapter 3. We're going to go to Judges chapter 3. We are in our eighth week of called and covered. Judges chapter 3, starting at verse 1. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, so it may be a little bit different than the translation that you are reading from, but it is all the word of God. Amen? Amen. Judges chapter 3, starting at verse 1, the word of God says, these are the nations that the Lord left in the land to test those Israelites who had not experienced the wars of Canaan. Can I read that one more time? These are the nations that the Lord left in the land to test those Israelites who had not experienced the wars of Canaan. It goes on to say, he did this to teach warfare to generations of Israelites who had no experience in battle. It says, these are the nations, the Philistines, those living under the five Philistine rulers, all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites living in the mountains of Lebanon and Mount Baal, Hermon, and Lebo Hamath. It says these people were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the commands the Lord had given to their ancestors through Moses. Thus ends the reading of the scripture. Listen to me. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm going to give you, I'm gonna give you the, the subtitle in a moment. Um, but I need you to understand that according to the word of God, just want to make sure we're on the same page, there were some folks that God left among his people in order to test their commitment, their obedience, to test their self-discipline. Y'all guys follow me? Are there some people that you can think of right now? If they're in the room, don't look at them. <laughs> that the Lord has allowed to remain around you and you wondering why? Lord, why don't they just leave? Lord, open up an opportunity for them in California. <laughs> Send them to Florida, God. I know they like that kind of weather. This word says that God left some folks in the land, land that they possessed in order to test them. Can I give you the subtitle for today's message under called and covered? And, uh, and if, you, if you will, I'm going to ask that you repeat after me. Look at somebody in the room and look at them and say, it's only, it's only a, a test. test. One more time. It's only, it's only a test. test. Allow me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being gathered in this place today. God, I thank you for the worship that was rendered as an offering to you, God. We thank you for those that saw fit to use their gifting, their ability, and their anointing to usher in the Holy Spirit today. I thank you for everybody under the sound of my voice, God, that did not allow the rain to keep them from the house of God. Right now, I ask that I would decrease and you would increase. Touch my mouth. Place your words in it as you did with your prophet Jeremiah, that what is spoken in this house today would edify your body, but more than that, would bring glory to your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, I got to share with you that it was impressed upon me to give you this word. And, and if I'm honest with you, I was wrestling between giving you this word last week or giving you last week's word. And the reason I was wrestling with it is because sequentially this scripture happened before the scripture I gave you last week. I gave you Judges 331 last week and I'm giving you Judges 3.1 this week. And if I'm honest with you, I struggle with that because I know that some of you guys are sequential thinkers. I've shared with you, if you've listened to me, I'm not a sequential thinker. Nah, I'll be over here, over here, over here. I'll be. 
And so I don't have to get it straight. But I said, Lord, I don't know. They might not be able to receive what happened in 331 without first hearing what happened in 31. But he said, this is the word that I need for this week. That's the word you're going to give next week. And so now I need you to be obedient to what it is I'm doing. And so and so it was impressed upon me to give you this word. And I believe that it was impressed upon me that you would not be imprisoned to your ignorance. Yeah, I, I believe I believe that it was impressed that we might not be imprisoned by ignorance. See, I know that the word ignorance has been characterized by merely being ignorant. And depending on how you've heard that word in context, it means something different to you. Amen. You ever seen somebody acting a fool and said, they just being ignorant. Depending on your orientation, you don't add the uh, extra R. You, they, they ignorant. They just ignorant. When they real bad, they ignorant. You know, but when it's ignorant. They just being ignorant. Some of y'all looking like, nope, nope, never heard that before, Pastor. This is a, I'm going to write this one down. This is a new one, Pastor. Ignant. But I want to make sure, and you know I am a word person. So I want to make sure that when you hear words, you understand the actual definition and not merely just the context in which you heard some of these words, right? And so I want you guys to first look at the definition for ignorant, which means lacking in knowledge or training. It does not mean being a clown. It does not mean acting out of character or out of the ordinary. It does not mean acting a fool or being inappropriate. Ignorant, by definition, means lacking in knowledge or training. See, contrary to the context in which people use it, being ignorant does not equate to buffoonery. It, it, it isn't something or someone acting ridiculously out of character or being a clown. Ignorant is lacking knowledge or training. See, my conviction is that the God we serve does not desire for you to be ignorant. Because if you are ignorant, you don't possess the knowledge or training. And one thing that God is going to do is call you. And I've defined for you that to be called is to be invited into alignment with God's assignment. Will you say I'm called? I'm called. But in order for you to be equipped for the assignment, you cannot be ignorant. Yeah. Yep. And so I believe that God counters ignorance with information to ensure that you're not only called, but that you're also covered. And I've defined for you that to be covered means to have everything that you need in order to do what it is that God is calling you to do. Will you say, I'm covered? All right, now I need you to put it together. Will you say, I'm called and covered? One more time, I'm called and covered. See, in the text, it says these are the nations that the Lord left in the land to test those Israelites who had not experienced the wars of Canaan. It said he did this to teach warfare to generations of Israelites who had no experience in the battle. Do y'all know some people that can't fight? If it's you, don't raise your, raise your hand. Don't, do, don't raise your hand. But I'm going to be honest with you. I know some people that cannot fight. And I'm going to tell you this. There's certain places I'm going that if you can't fight James, you can go, but you can't go with me. I'm just being honest with you. I come from an upbringing. You, there's some things you ain't going to have to worry about with Pastor Kevin. You're not going to hear that somebody caught Pastor Kevin down at the Flint Farmer's Market and whooped his tail. That just ain't going to happen. Not with me. Where Merv at? Merv, you in the house. Wave your hand, Merv. Y'all see Merv? Merv in the gym with me at 5 a.m. every day. Merv will tell you, I'm bobbing and weaving. <laughs> But you know, some people cannot fight. But I want you to think about this a little bit different. I'm being funny with the fighting. Hopefully you don't hear Pastor Kevin is fighting with nobody. 
Amen. I say that to be funny, but I need you to understand that the battle that is being talked about in Scripture is physical battle. If you know the word of God, you know that they had to have a sword. They had to have a spear. They had to be able to fight physically. The way that I want you to internalize the information in the text is that I want you to understand that there's some people that might be in your sphere of influence. Not so that you learn how to duke up, but that you learn a level of battle that is spiritual and not physical. That you learn that no matter what it is that somebody does in my presence or to me, that there is some behavior that I am just not going to manifest. There are some words that are not going to come out of my mouth. There's some ways that you're not going to be able to say that I behaved among you because I am experienced in battle. That I've had some of the worst personalities that you can think of do everything they can do to tap dance on my nerves and I had enough self-discipline that there was enough Holy Spirit in me for me not to give them what I know they deserved. See, because there's some people that can't give you what you want. I'm not one of those people. Um, listen to me. I know how to speak. I know how to cuss you out. I know how to cuss you out professionally. I know how to cuss you out without using a curse word. But if I do that, you'll be able to say that I hurt your feelings. If I do that, you'll be able to say, you, you're not going to believe what he said to me. And then they hit you with the, uh, listen, this is the point right here. If there was, a, if there was an organist, there was, and he's supposed to be a pastor. <laughs> he did this to teach warfare to the generations of the Israelites who had no experience in battle. Can I give you point number one if you're a point taker? Point number one is God left a lesson. See, I need you to understand that God could have eliminated those nations from among them. See, if you remember when he sent Saul in order to kill the Amalekites, he told them, I don't want you to leave anything. I want you to kill every man, every woman, every child. I want you to kill the cattle. I don't want there to be any remnant of Amalek in history. And so it's important for you to understand that God had the ability to eliminate these people's very memory from existence in the earth, but he doesn't. And he doesn't because nothing is beyond God's use. For his glory. Can I tell you that the psalmist says in uh, psalmist, uh, Psalm 119, 91, says your laws endure to this day for all things serve you. See, I need you to understand, right? Will you say all things? Nothing is wasted when it comes to God. And so God can use your wins and he can use your losses. That God can use your strengths and he can use your weaknesses, he can use your faults, your failures, and your frailties because nothing is beyond his use. Will you say all things? All. See, I need you to understand that while God can use anything, God does not use everything. You ain't got your shout yet. Take your time. See, I'm going to walk you into this. Can I, can I repeat it so you can tweet it? While God can use anything, God does not use everything. And, and the reason that you need to understand that, right, is because there is a story in the Bible with a character by the name of Job. And if you know the story of Job, it's a difficult story for people to digest. But I remember spending weeks teaching on Job. But I need you to understand that one of the things, if nothing else, that you should be able to extract from Job is that in the scripture, Satan comes before God because Satan has to present himself like everybody else because God is God overall. 
the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Everything is under his rule. And so no matter how much you think Satan is running on a rampage, there are certain things Satan can't do. And so he has to present himself. And what I love is, I love this because you know when somebody has ultimate authority over themselves, when you ask them what you've been doing or where you at, don't call me asking where I'm at. What you doing? Uh, what you need? That's what I might say. Huh? If you know me, you know that's real. Hey, what you doing? Why? What you need? The reality is this, though. When God addresses the enemy and says, where you been? He has no other choice except to say where he's been. And so he tells him, I've been going to and through. I've been everywhere looking around, trying to figure out whose life I can mess up. That's Pastor Kevin translation. And so what God says is, have you considered... My servant Job, as you've been going to and fro, I know you've been looking at different people, but have you considered Job? And Satan has the audacity to be like, you talking about the one who you've been prospering continually? Are you talking about Job, who you've had a wall of protection around? Your hedge of protection is so high, I don't even mess with him. I walk past Job when I see him because in my mind I'm thinking, ain't no need to mess with him because no matter what I send his way, God is going to block it. So it's important for you to understand that while God can use anything, God does not use everything. And so what ends up happening is he say, you can try Job. But I tell you what. Don't touch his body. And you can't take his life. Can I tell you what that should mean to you? That should mean to you that even your struggles have standards. What? Even... Even your problems have to qualify to be a problem for you. Because while God can use anything, God does not use everything. And so when you have an obstacle in your course, the obstacle is in your course because he knows that it's going to build you up and not tear you down. Oh, we I hope you get this. God can use anything but he does not use everything. So you got to get this in your spirit. If you get this in your spirit, it'll change the way that you look at your problems. If you get this in your spirit, it'll change the way that you look at your opposition. See, because even your opposition has to qualify to be opposition for you because God is so good that if it's not going to be helpful on your course, he is not going to put it in your journey. God is too good for that. He's not playing a game with you. He's got purpose and destiny for you. And so God says, uh, no, nah, not for my baby. Uh, no, nah, we're not going to do that. We? What you have to understand is that God decides, I'm not putting it here to hurt you. I'm putting it here to help you which means that we have to trust God enough to know even if it hurts right now, it's helping in the future. Even if it's painful right now, it's got a purpose in the future. Even if I don't like it right now, I'm going to love it when it's over. Have you ever had experiences in your life that you would have never chosen for yourself? But once you found yourself on the other side of it, you say, Lord, they can't take away from me the strength that I sustain through this. They can't take from me the wisdom that I gained because I had it. Oh, we the joy that I have. The world ain't give it to me and the world can't take it away. What? And so I need you to understand that God left a lesson 
He can use anything, but he doesn't use everything. And so he left a lesson. But I got to help you right here. Because sometimes we find ourselves in the midst of the journey, and it feels like God left us. If you've ever been there, say amen. amen. See, see, every now and then I'll find myself in some obstacles and some problems, and many of them I've created for myself. Just being honest with you. Sometimes I walk myself right into a minefield. I can't blame the devil on everything I'm going through because some of it I paved the way for it. Don't worry, devil, I got this today. You go ahead and take a break. Creating problems for myself. And so the reality is, right, that sometimes it feels like God has left us. But can I encourage you to understand that the word of God says that I will never leave you nor forsake you. What did he tell Joshua? He tells him, as I was with Moses, I shall be with you. Can I tell you that as he was with Joshua, he will be with you. God ain't leave you. What he left was a lesson. Oh, man, I love this word. Listen to me. I need you guys to get this. So, so, so he leaves a lesson. And, um, and, and it's important for you to understand why God would do this, right? In Judges 1, excuse me, Judges 3, 1, he says, these are the nations that the Lord left in the land to test those Israelites who had not experienced the war, wars of Canaan. He did this to teach warfare to generations of Israelites who had no experience in battle. Can I give you point number two? Point number two is ignorance invites infiltration. Yeah, ignorance invites infiltration. And so I need you to understand that ignorance is the absence of knowledge or training. And, and if, you, if you've been a Baptist baby for a long time, you know that um, one of the scriptures that people say all the time is my people perish all right, some Baptist babies in the room. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. Then they stop right there. They don't, they don't give it to you all. They don't give it to you all. They leave you under the impression that people are perishing due to being ignorant. And that's just not true. You're not perishing because you're ignorant. The word of God says my people perish for a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding. But it goes on to say because you have rejected knowledge... You've rejected understanding, and because God is such a good God, what he does is he counters the ignorance with information, meaning that whether you pick it up or you leave it laying down, there is information for you to be able to arm yourself with. Why do you have to arm yourself? Because God knows enough to know that ignorance invites infiltration. What is infiltration? Infiltration is when something comes in that's not supposed to be there. When you are infiltrated, it means that people that are not of us come into us and then set up camp among us that they might be able to vanquish us. That's why I never have a problem with people that got to lead this church. Huh? It's some folks that was with us last year that ain't with us this year. And it ain't personal. It's purposeful. What the word of God says, they went out from among us because they were not of us. Because if they were of us, they would have stayed among us. I'm not kidding you. I don't care what excuse you make for leaving. Go ahead and go. I'm not mad at you because if God has to give you another word through another man and another worship service, I care more about you getting it than you getting it from me. Ooh. So when they got to go, I tell them goodbye from a good place. May the Lord watch between me and thee as we are absent one from another. God bless you and God keep you. It ain't personal. It's purposeful. Because here's the real deal. If you're sitting out there mad at me, guess what? There's an energy that you're bringing in. There's a spirit that you're walking under. I don't need that spirit in here. I need a spirit of expectation in here. I need a spirit of worship in here. I need a spirit of kindness. In so when you got to go, you ain't got to send me a text message. Mm-mm. Don't put nothing on the church website. Mm-mm. Don't, mm-mm. Don't send us an inbox. Mm-mm. We ain't interested. We don't care. Not that we don't care about you. We care about you. 
getting to where you're going. Because you have to understand, in our immaturity, we will feel like we failed you. Can I help you understand something? It ain't my responsibility to succeed you. Dan, I love you. But if Jesus don't do it, Pastor Kevin can't. I, it's not my response. We didn't fail you. We prepared you for your next worship experience. We just trying to usher you in. May the Lord bless you. And so it's important for you to understand that when it comes to infiltration, in order to make sure that you don't lack the knowledge or the training to recognize when there is a wolf among you. Can I, can I take you back to the garden? I was going to show the scriptures. I'm not going to show all the scriptures, uh, Sue. I appreciate you. I'm not going to show all the scriptures. But m many of you know what happened in the garden. And so in, in the garden experience, you've got Eve who's talking to the serpent. It says the serpent, cunning, crafty. Serpent comes and says, listen. You know that tree out there God told you not to do? Let me tell you why. <laughs> Pastor Kevin translation. Let me tell you why God told you not to do that. Told you not to do that because he knows. You take a bite of that fruit, you're going to be just like God. Ignorance. Invites. Infiltration. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because in the garden, according to Genesis 1 and 26, God decided, the Godhead decided, the Holy Trinity determined that we will make man in our image. It says male and female in verse 27. He created them. What? In the image and the likeness of God. What does that mean? That means that when the serpent is talking to Eve, Eve don't need to eat nothing to be any more like God. Eve was more like God than me and you was like God. Direct. The challenge is when you don't have the training for the spiritual warfare, you will allow other voices to get into your ear and tell you things about you that are just not true. So now I'm trying to become what you think I should be instead of realizing that God has already placed in me everything that I need to be who he called me to be. See, ignorance invites infiltration. And so when I don't know better, I won't do better. But listen to me, when I listen to what God has told me, when I stop listening about what you think I should be doing, how you think I should be behaving, and I begin looking at what the word of God says about me, then I'm no longer ignorant, which means I'm no longer susceptible to the strategies of the enemy. See, the challenge is the enemy offers you a counterfeit, hoping that you will forsake the real thing. Yep, yeah, because that's what he did with it, right? He says, look, if you eat this, you'll become like this. Now, she already like this. What did she end up doing? She ended up forfeiting how much like God she was to be like us. Sinful. Fearful. Somebody said ashamed. None of that in the beginning. Before they eat the fruit, they don't even know. There's kids in here. And so I need you to understand that when God opts to use the things around you to test you because there is certain warfare that you have not been exposed to. Meaning that because of what it is that he has called you to do, 
that he must also cover you to be able to achieve it. I cannot say I covered you if I did not prepare you for the problems that are going to be on your journey. Have you ever been in a situation where you're dealing with something difficult and you're talking to somebody about it and they saying to you stuff that you already know? They ain't give you no fresh revelation. They said to you all the words that God already deposited down into you. You already know the answer is to overcome it. The answer is I got to ignore it. The answer is I got to rise above it. The answer is I already know better. The answer is self-discipline. The answer is hold my tongue. The answer is I can't be so focused on them that I make excuses for me. And so the word of God says these people were left. It says that these people were left. (laughs) These people were left in order to test. Not to test whether or not they could fight. You seeing that? Mm -mm. See, if you're not, if you, you will get so consumed by the battle that you'll understand that he wasn't teaching them how to train with swords. They knew how to fight some battles, I'm sure. They had not been trained for the type of opposition that happened in Canaan, though. Meaning that when you get to a new level. That there's new opposition. And for where I'm taking you, I know that you know how to handle situations at level two. But I've got to put enough pressure on you that you understand how to handle situations at level 10. Because what you conquered at level two is not going to fare well at level 10 says they were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would. Y'all remember Samuel told Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. God said, I'm not, I'm not trying to learn about your sword skills. I don't need to know how well you can handle a javelin. This isn't about your ability to use a shield. This is about your ability to be inclined to listen to my commands over everybody else's. This is about making sure that when you have to make the decision between what it is that I have told you to do and what the world is telling you to do, that you will go with what I am telling you to do. This is when you are coming up against culture and you have to decide between culture and the kingdom, that you don't decide that culture is more valuable than the kingdom. So he did this to see if they would obey his commands. Can I give you the last point? And I'm done. The last point is testing versus tempting. See, unfortunately, I think that there are some people that have a misconception that these two things are the same. And they are not the same. If I can give you definition... To tempt is to attract or entice someone or something, even if it is into something wrong or indivisible. You guys with me? It is to attract or entice, even if it's the wrong thing. Whereas the definition for test is a procedure that is intended to establish quality, performance, or reliability of something. Tempting, attract you, entice you, even if it's wrong. Testing is to confirm that there is quality, that there is performance, 
that there's reliability. Can I help you to understand? God don't tempt us, but he does test us. Get this. I need you guys to go back to school. Do you remember in school that the test came? The test came after the lessons had already been left. So lessons were left. And then in order, in order to make sure that you got the lesson, the test was to prove your performance, your quality, your reliability. Can I tell you that temptation is intended to expose your weakness, while testing is intended to manifest your strengths? See, you got to make sure that you put it in the right context. If you're feeling tempted by something, that's how you know that that's the devil. Because the devil brings temptation. The devil identifies the thing that he knows you like, that you're not supposed to have, and then parades it in front of you. Whereas what God does is say, I know the information that I put in you. I know what I have trained you to do. You won't perish for a lack of knowledge. If you perish, it'll be because you rejected everything that I gave you. But because I know what I put in you, now it's time for you to show the quality and the performance and the reliability that I know that I've equipped you with. See, God is so good that he don't put you in a situation to expose that you're weak. He puts you in a situation to prove to you that you're strong that you're stronger than you think you are, that you can handle more than what you believed you could, that you could survive even the most difficult of circumstances, not because of you, but because of the God that you serve, saying I thought enough of you that I made sure I put it in you and I gave you an extra measure of grace and I gave you an extra measure of mercy because I knew you might not get all the answers right. So I need you to make sure that you're deciphering the difference between testing and tempting. It's a test to show you that there's strengths. The test uncovers the strength that God has been placing in you all along the way, giving you lessons, preparing you, teaching you. Can I tell you that there are some of us in this room that know that there are certain personality types that if you had caught us two months ago, two years ago, two days ago, you would have gotten a completely different version of me, baby. You would have. But because of what God has been giving me, the way that God has been teaching me, the lessons that God has been laying out in my life, now I'm able to deal with a contrary spirit a completely different way. Can I be transparent and honest in this place? And it, last night we had, a, we had an event. We had an event. It was from outside. Somebody came in, a great friend of mine, did a worship experience. It wasn't y'all. It was people from outside. And there was a contrary spirit. Now, I know some of y'all look at me and you think, oh, he's so kind and so sweet and so nice. He just smiles all the time. He's just such a nice guy. He's just so nice. <laughs> Will y'all say and? Yeah. I'm that and. <laughs> and I, you have to understand. I meet threats at the door. I don't know no other way to do it. Hyper aggressive. I work real hard to be passive. I work real hard to be. I accommodate, but I'm not an easily accommodating person. I'm difficult sometimes. And so when I see a contrary spirit come into a place that I'm responsible to safeguard and protect, the first thing I want to do is, uh, hey, hey, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? God bless you. Um, did you get lost? Uh, who you here for? What are you here for? Because you can't just have any all spirit. Oh, 
I know there's some novice in the room. I need you to understand this. It's important for you to understand that church is a place where everybody can come. It's not a place where everybody should come because everybody is not looking for Jesus. And anybody that's not looking for Jesus ought not be coming to this place. Listen to me. I need you to understand that there's some people in here that need somebody that is willing to safeguard on every side. You think we got campus safety just to make sure that don't nobody break out into a fight? Campus safety got to be able to pray too. Campus safety has to have discernment too. Campus safety has to be able to look and say, mm, something ain't right about the spirit of this person. And so, no, we're not going to tell them they got to leave, but we're going to keep an eye on them, baby. We're going to keep an eye on them. You got them, I got them. We got them. And so if I'm honest with you, the lessons that I've learned along the way allow me to be in this space with a contrary spirit. And instead of addressing them, I decided that I would appeal to the Lord above. Oh, listen to me. That's a different level of spiritual maturity. When I know what you own, but I decide I'm not going to get on it with you. I need you to understand. So instead, what I had to do is from where I was, say in my own, Lord, I'm just asking that whatever spirit they're under, that it would not rule in this place. Father God, I ask that you would bind it up and cast it out in the name of Jesus. Lord, if they came here to create some division, I just ask right now, God, that you would bind them, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to them in a special way. God, right now, I ask that they would be reveal that you are the king of king and the lord of lord that any attack that they intend in this place would be canceled in the name of jesus we ain't having it not here not an ntc so i share that with you so that you understand that if you had called me one year ago two years ago three years ago i'd have looked at i looked at kaylin kaylin mm -mm. That's all I got to do. They out of here. But instead, I realize that sometimes you've got to overcome the unction to submit to your most basic of instincts. That you've got to ask God to put some super on your natural so that you make a decision in wisdom. Because these people are crazy. Will you stand with me? If this was a blessing to you, put your hands together if you will. I want you to be encouraged. 